check, mic check. Did that one by myself too. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, just so you all know, like I'm not attached to any side of the sanctuary. We have this one set up for people who desire social distancing and this one for, for, for people who don't. So if you all feel like you wanna be close together, you're welcome to sit over here. I'll go wherever you go. So just, <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, welcome everybody. It is good to be with you all tonight. Um, we, uh, so we have been meeting in here and probably will be, uh, for some time, maybe forever at this point, because this is the place that is set up to live stream to our Facebook and live stream to our YouTube channel. The gym is only set up to go on to zoom. Um, and so this uh, is where I can um, do this and people can join us online. Uh, so it works out really well. So I appreciate you all making the little trek down the hallway um, here into this space. We have been, um, so since we started, for those of you who maybe have, have missed a few or haven't been here at all um, in the adult Bible studies or whatever we're calling these, Wednesday Connect Bible studies, um, since we started back in August, um, I did a, a study about the difficult words of Jesus, and then the last couple, I've uh, sort of paralleled what's happening in the sermon series, and that's where we are right now. So uh, if you were here on Sunday or you check your mail, you know that it's um, commitment time, it's pledge time, it's November, uh, which is when we start talking about money, and um, and that ends with... with uh, calling for commitments or pledges for the coming year. Um, so that's where we are. And um, I'm a person, I, I've said this before, I'm a person who doesn't mind talking about money. Um, uh, and in particular, as it relates to the life of faith, just like I don't mind talking about uh, reading scripture or coming to worship or praying or anything else. All of these are ways that we live out our faith and practice our faith. Um, and so... I think you all heard on Sunday me tell you how much giving is talked about in the Bible. So it's way more than you can talk about in three sermons. Uh, so I am continuing this month to parallel um, the, the sermon series and to supplement what you're hearing on Sunday mornings uh, with what we're studying here on Sunday nights. So I mean Wednesday nights. So that's what we're doing right now. So um, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, as we come together tonight to study your word, I pray that you would fill our lives with wisdom and with understanding. I pray that you would help us um, always to put our trust in you above everything else, over money, over riches, over uh, the security even of, of homes and, and, and shelter and, and clothing and food even, to, to put you first and everything. And I pray that that as we seek to do that, you would help us to keep our priorities fully kingdom focused um, rather than investment focused and, and that you would free us from, 
from the inner grip of temptation um, and, and striving for the next best thing and instead um, to, to look for fullness of life in you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to ask a question. When you think of, uh, let's just define, what is consumerism? Buying stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, consumerism, buying stuff. Other ideas? What comes to mind? Yeah, okay, consumer report. It's what? Making decisions about purchases, yeah. Did, you, did you, Somebody over here said something. Did I? Using stuff, yeah, consuming it, yep, yeah. Any other ideas about consumerism? Keeping up with the Joneses, yeah, yep. So, so there's sort of one level where it's you, you buy the stuff, you, you buy stuff, right? And some of that stuff maybe you need, some of the stuff maybe you want. And then there's another, another level, I think, of consumerism where, yeah, you're keeping up with the Joneses. You're spending the money that you got coming into the bank. You're, you know, chasing after the next best thing. Um, try, maybe even looking for satisfaction uh, in some way. Do we have anybody, I'm not one of these people, I hate shopping. <laughs> do, do, we, do we have people that are like, your th shopping is your therapy. It's it's okay to be. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being honest, Teresa. <laughs> Some in my family are that way, uh, and I understand. You know, uh, sh like I said, uh, shopping is not my therapy, but I understand that the having practices. You know, um, so um, thinking about consumerism. Anybody want to talk about a time when you felt the pull? of consumerism, when you felt uh, maybe some influence about how you consume things, anything like that? Anybody got a story they want to share? Or you thought you had to, yeah? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was crazy, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> really bad. <laughs> other, other examples? Things when you've um, felt the pull of consumerism or the, the need to, to make a purchase or um, anything like that? It is freaky, and you know what I've noticed lately uh, is sometimes if I just say something, they're listening. Yes, it's like what? What? Uh, yeah, yeah. Isn't it crazy? So, so real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. These things right here. Uh, they, they, they've got us. Big Brother is watching. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, isn't that, and, and I think that's one of the things, um, you know, more and more and more, um, and, and you all maybe have had these conversations, we can see how much companies invest in advertising and now especially directed advertising and how much they count on that. And, you know, if they're doing that and they're investing in that, it means they're seeing returns from that. It means it's effective. Um, so, uh, you, you know, like an example right now uh, is all these lawsuits from uh, like, I don't know who all it is, these ad agencies that are suing uh, Apple 
because Apple has made it where, where you, you can't be tracked, like you can say, I don't want to be tracked or whatever. Um, and so that has made it more difficult for companies to do directed advertising. And now they're suing, <laughs> uh, suing Apple to, to try and get this right to do directed advertising uh, at us. And, and again, that's a ton of money, not only to make the advertisements, but to enter into legal action, which means it must be effective. So, so really there is this strong worldly message about you need this, whatever it is this is. Um, and, and sometimes we can, we can say, no, I don't, or we can say, I don't have money for that or, or whatever. And sometimes we give in. I mean, let's just be honest. I know. We do. Yes. Yes. Or, or uh, go ahead and buy it now because um, the, be, if the price is going to go up. Uh, like, like this week, the thing, inflation is, is big, you know, and yeah, the supply chain thing, like buy it now and you'll have it by Christmas maybe. Which, when you have a six-year-old, is really hard to do. Yeah, my, my mom tells a story about when I was, I don't know, probably six or seven, and, and the big thing that year were Cabbage Patch Kids. And, yes, yeah, and we're, we're the same age, yeah, you know, so it was probably about the same time. And so, Mom, all the way up to Christmas, what do you want for Christmas? I was saying whatever it was. You don't want a Cabbage Patch doll? No, I don't want a Cabbage Patch doll. She said, like, two days before Christmas. I was like, Mom, I want a cabbage patch doll. I don't remember if I got I think I got it for my birthday that year, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's, and when you have kids, it's even more challenging because they're kids, right? I mean, uh, next bright, shiny thing, it, it's cool for a few minutes, and then that, that's it. So, so, yeah, there's these messages all the time about, about consumerism, about buying, about, um, you need this or that. Um, but then when we look in the Bible, of course, what we see from God is this call uh, to generosity. So there's a couple passages we're going to look at tonight. Um, if you can turn with me to 1 Timothy um, chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 7 through 12, and then I'm going to read verses uh, 17 through 19. Paul writes, we didn't bring anything into the world, and so we can't take anything out of it. We'll be happy with food and clothing, but people who are trying to get rich fall into temptation. They are trapped by many stupid and harmful passions that plunge people into ruin and destruction. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some have wandered away from the faith and have impaled themselves with a lot of pain because they made money their goal. But as for you, man of God, run away from all these things. Instead, pursue, pursue righteousness, holy living, faithfulness, love, endurance, and gentleness. Compete in the good fight of faith. Grab hold of eternal life, of the eternal life. You were called to it. And you made a good confession of it in the presence of many witnesses. And then near the end of, of this letter, it says, Tell people who are rich at this time not to become egotistical and not to place their hope on their finances, which are uncertain. Instead, they need to hope in God, who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. Tell them to do good, to be rich in the good things they do, to be generous and to share with others. When they do these things... 
They will save a treasure for themselves that is a good foundation for the future. That way, they can take hold of what is truly life. So it's believed that this letter to, uh, to Timothy was written by Paul. That's a little bit disputed. It's possible it was written by somebody else. Um, whatever the case, it seems like Paul wrote this letter or who, this letter was written to share some counsel and some wisdom with Timothy in his work um, as one of the younger apostles. Uh, and especially as it relates to Timothy's ministry in Ephesus. And so a lot of this letter, and part of the reason they wonder if it was written by Paul, is because a lot of this letter addresses misteachings that have sort of embedded in the early Christian church. Um, and, and so Paul, or the writer, is trying to, to bring those things out and identify them and correct them and, and help Timothy correct them them and what they're hearing. Um, so, <clears throat> and what you can see and hopefully what you heard in that passage there was that um, these wrong teachings that, that are circulating through these early Christian communities are pretty worldly teachings, right? And it turns out, I think, it's stuff we're stealing, still dealing with today. So this, this was a problem then and it's still a problem now. How many of you have heard this phrase, money is the root of all evil? Yeah. But that's not actually what it says, is it? Yeah. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, not money itself. And so what this passage is really getting at, it's not saying money is bad. It's saying how you use your money can be unhealthy, that, that you can, um, it can cause temptation. It can cause you to miss, miss set your uh, priorities. Um, it could lead to pride, potentially. Um, so, really what I hope, you know, you heard Paul, a writer, kind of lay out this, um, the love of money is the root of all evil, kind of talking about how going the way of the world can cause problems. And then what does he do? You remember what he lists after that? He says, instead, do this. You remember? Yeah, pursue righteousness. Did it sound like the fruits of the Spirit? Yeah, gentleness. It is. This is one of the places where we have sort of a listing of the fruits of, of the Spirit. Um, and so, so there's not only this... Um, rooting out the be careful about money but also part of the lesson here is making sure you set your priorities correctly that what you're investing yourself and your energy in is 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 godly it's righteous it is uh, fruit the fruit of God's work in our lives not the fruit of of the world's um, temptation and the world's work in our lives um, and so what that means is we always have to check ourselves and our, our desire to have more. Um, <laughs> because as, as Paul teaches, it can, it can lead us to, to indulge in, in stupid and, and harmful things. Um, I kind of like that line. <laughs> uh, we never think it's stupid uh, until later, right? Until it's too late. <laughs> till the harm has been done. Um, the treasure that God offers is eternal. Anything that the world can give is not. Our future is in God, not in our possessions. Our, our future is not in our bank account, despite our best efforts to build up a 401k. That's not our future, right? Um, at, at, at our investments. It was funny, we were on a... Um, uh, a Sabbath retreat. The staff was on Sabbath retreat Monday night and yesterday. And uh, we were having a conversation, I think it was at lunch yesterday. Tina, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we were talking about money. I don't even remember why. Uh, but Don Washburn, the, the uh, director up at Camp Lookout, he said something about, you know, these people with millions of dollars, like, we don't even understand. We don't even, you know. Um, I have some relatives who are millionaires, 
Um, and and I, I do understand it, and, and thankfully they have a, a pretty healthy perspective about their money. Uh, they also have a lot of things that only millionaires can have. <laughs> um, but I, I say that to say um, uh, what I'm getting to is it is so easy to get sucked into what we do or what we don't have and to forget how our entire future is in God. Um, just a little statistic to kind of go along with that. Um, I was doing some research for this Sunday sermon and in there was a study done of tax returns, people's tax returns about four or five years ago. And uh, on average, people with an adjusted gross income of $35,000 or less give about 9% of their income to charity, to nonprofits. If you go up and look at people whose adjusted gross income is more than $150,000, so five times basically, the, they give on average 3%. I have a really great story I love to tell. I might have told it to y'all last year. It's a good sermon illustration. I'm not going to use it in a, in a sermon this year. Um, about a guy who was barely getting by, and he called his pastor, and he said, Pastor, I need, I need you to pray for me. I, I, you know, I'm not hardly making enough money. I, I barely get by. And so the pastor said, I'll pray with you, but I need you to do something. I want you to make it a priority to give 10% to God. And the guy was like, well, you know, I'm making $17,000 a year. That's, you know, $1,700. So that's, you know, $150 a month or something, whatever. He was like, I think I can do that. So he started doing it. Things got better. He got promoted, whatever. Uh, calls the pastor back several years later. He says, Pastor, I need you to, to pray for me. Um, you know, I'm, uh, there's some things that I really need and I just can't give that $1,700 to the church anymore. <laughs> so pastor said, all right, done, let's pray. Pastor says, starts praying, says, God, I'm gonna need you to lower this man's salary back down to that $17,000 so that he can pay his tithe again. <laughs> uh, so there, there, it, it, it's so, and we do it, we don't realize it. And that's why one of the things I like to talk about is I think generosity, and I'm really getting into teaching here, to me, giving and generosity is a spiritual discipline, just like praying is just like worshiping is, you have to think about it the same way. It is a way we live out our faith. Um, and it's a way that we keep God first in our lives. And so to me, it's almost, and I think I talked about this a little bit last week, it's almost important just to have the regular practice of giving and saying like mentally or with the click of the mouse or with the drop of the check into the offering plate or whatever it is, God, I'm giving you this offering. I'm saying thank you to you what you've done in my life. Um, so, so there's two parts to giving and to generosity um, and to how we handle our money. One is this scriptural thing about the tithe, which we talked about last week here, but the other part is the practice of regularly giving to God from what we have. I'm sorry, this thing is not staying on my ear tonight. Um, so there's a, um, there's a YouTube channel uh, that takes you inside luxurious investment properties. Um, and there was one um, not too long ago, like a $35 million property, that part of the way they were advertising, these are, these are luxury properties that are, uh, that are for sale. So part of the way they were advertising this $35 million property is that if you buy this $35 million property, you get a Porsche and a Bentley for free. <laughs> Um, also, it, in this property, next to the basement sauna, there was a cold room with a snow machine in it. So, yeah. <laughs> um, what, how do you think God views 
that approach to life, that life sort of lifestyle. I know for me, one of the things I think, and, that, and uh, talking about my family, I sort of have this wrestling thing every time we go to one of their properties. But, um, it's like all the things that money could be used for, <laughs> all the ways that lives could be changed. Um, and, and that's the thing, I, you know, we talked about, was it Sunday or last week, about how when we give, um, whatever we give, when we give, that can become an answer to someone's prayer. There, there was a, and I think I'm going to say that this is a problem with doing studies that parallel your sermons, but I think I'm going to say this on Sunday too. You know, there's a gap between where the world is and where it wants to be, where God wants the world to be. And when we give, we begin to close that gap. Um, and I do, I think that's, that's what, um, it's not that, it's not that, People who haven't worked hard don't deserve to enjoy the fruits of their labor, certainly. Uh, but at the same time, as Christians, we are called to care for and love one another. And when we have the ability to do that, we should do that. Um, how, do, how do Paul's words to Timothy sort of speak to that? And it says, what, don't, I forget how it's put. I've read so many verses on money in the last two weeks. Don't be proud and arrogant. Yes, thank you. Don't be proud and arrogant. There's some other stuff in there, right? Contemptuous of others. There we go. That was the one that was in my head. Don't set your hope hopes on uncertain riches. Yeah, I mean, that's what happened in the crash at, at the Great Depression, right? The roaring t 20s and people built up their wealth and, and their security was entirely in that and then Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Real talk for a minute. If you had an extra $35 million, would it change the way you live? <laughs> she said no because mother wouldn't move anywhere else. <laughs> definitely will change your life and and yeah and then how you use that and again keeping things in perspective right so it's not that having the money is the problem it's how you use the money it's how you set your priorities it's how you live out your faith um, that matters okay let's turn to Acts uh, 20 a little bit more about Paul here um, I'm going to read again, beginning in verse 22. So this is Acts 20, uh, beginning in verse 22, and I'm going to read through verse 35. Now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what will happen to me there. This is Paul. What I do know is that the Holy Spirit testifies to me from city to city that prisons and troubles await me. But nothing, not even my life, is more important than my completing my mission. This is nothing other than the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify about the good news of God's grace. I know that none of you will see me again, you among whom I traveled and proclaimed the kingdom. Therefore, today I testify to you that I'm not responsible for anyone's fate. I haven't avoided proclaiming the entire plan of God to you. 
Watch yourselves in the whole flock in which the Holy Spirit has placed you as supervisors to shepherd God's church, which he obtained with the death of his own son. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you and won't spare the flock. Some of your own people will dis distort the word in order to lure followers after them. Stay alert. Remember that for three years, I constantly and tearfully warned each one of you. I never stopped warning you. Now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all whom God has made holy. I haven't craved anyone's silver, gold, or clothing. You yourselves know that I have provided for my own needs and for those of my companions with, whom, with my own hands. In everything I have shown you that by, hard, by working hard, we must help the weak. In this way, we remember the Lord's, Lord Jesus' words, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So I always like to do a little bit of context. Of course, Acts is the record of the very beginning of the, the Christian church um, and how the Christians kind of work to organize themselves and to spread the gospel message. So we talked on Sunday, uh, for those of you that were here, about Paul's missionary journeys and about how uh, part of what he was doing as he went around sharing the gospel message was he was appealing to these new Christians to give uh, to this Jerusalem offering, what, what's called in Acts a Jerusalem offering, um, that he was going to take back to help the people in Judea and, and around Jerusalem who had been affected by a really bad famine there. Um, and then in this passage, what we have is a record of Paul's kind of final, very emotional, sort of like his retirement speech, um, as, as he's kind of uh, finishing up um, his ministry in, in Ephesus, Ephesus, and, and um, part of what I think is compelling about this passage, there's a few things, but what he's doing is showing, he's kind of defining success in some ways, um, and he was sort of talking about his plans a little bit for retirement, one of which was... <laughs> I've told you everything you need to know, now the rest is up to you, uh, which is kind of funny. But, um, but he says at the very end, in verse 35, he quotes Jesus. This is the only direct quote we have of Jesus that's not also found in the gospel somewhere. It is more blessed to give than to receive. That's not in the gospels anywhere. But Paul quotes and says, the Lord said this. Um, so, um, so what, what sort of ties together here and, and what I hope you see is that part of Paul's kind of retirement plan, um, he was celebrating serving others. He was looking ahead to the time after his departure. But what he was really talking about there was in God's kingdom, not on earth. And so Paul, you know, I think there's this important message here, um, not only about uh, sharing the gospel, not only serving others by sharing the gospel, but also part of what he's talking about here is taking the collection back to Jerusalem sharing the gospel by serving others, by giving of ourselves. And then that's why we have this quote, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, so, so what's happening is Paul is he's saying goodbye to Ephesus. He's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to deliver this offering that he's been collecting for years and years as he's traveled around. Uh, and sometimes you may notice in some of his letters he talks about sending some back. So it's not everything. Like he's not, you know, don't worry. He wasn't skimming a little off the top or anything like that. Um, so, so he's talking about he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to de deliver these funds. He's collected many of them from Gentile Christians to Jewish Christians um, that were facing hardship um, from this fam famine. And, it, and as he goes, what I really want to lift up to you tonight, and this is a, the paraphrase from the message, but it's from verse 32. 
Paul says, I'm turning you over to God, our marvelous God, whose gracious word can make you into what he wants you to be and give you everything you could possibly need. The words we read were, now I entrust you to God in the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all whom God has made holy. So in other words, Paul envisions this life um, and fullness of life and God, of, God alone with all of our efforts here on earth being aimed at the well-being of the people around us. Spiritual, physical, their total well-being. So what, I want to just leave you with, with uh, something to take home, something to think about. A time when, when you spent money on something you really wanted versus a time when you gave to somebody who really needed. And, and what was the difference of the, that experience for you? Because that's what, part of what Paul is lifting, lifting up here. And what he's celebrating and challenging us with is that fullness of life is in giving ourselves away. And isn't that what Jesus taught us? Are there, I'm going to close us in prayer, um, but are there any uh, particular prayer requests that need to be lifted up tonight? Just a couple that have come into the office this week. Uh, Larry Putnam um, has been hospitalized this week with it's, it started with a lot of pain. Uh, they're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on. They think the pain is just from some degeneration, musculoskeletal de degeneration, but there's also heart problems and low blood pressure. Um, his daughter, Michelle, said they're probably going to do a procedure, a cardioversion tomorrow. Um, so I, he did talk to me from his bed in the background and um, was grateful for the call. But, but be in prayer for Larry and also uh, Jared Rowe, um, is hospitalized again. Beth just told me they've just put him in a room. He's been in the ER since yesterday. He's got a little bit of pneumonia. He's got swelling in his legs. And a lot of different things going on there. So prayers especially for him too. Any others? All right, let's bow for a word of prayer. Loving God, I praise you for the abundant life that has been shared with us through your Son and, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you for the example he set for us of, of costly self-giving. And I pray, Lord, that you would guide each of us as we seek to grow in our faith, as we seek to grow towards you, towards the same sort of costly self-giving, sort of, towards the same sort of... Um, selfless generosity that becomes a part of your kingdom work and, and helps more and more people experience life in you. But especially tonight, God, we lift um, Larry and Jared to you and other people who are facing challenges and hardships right now, God. I pray that you would, you would bring healing to them. I pray that you would bring strength comfort, peace, rest, that you would calm their spirits and their minds, and that they would know your love in all things. Go with us as we leave this place tonight. Keep us safe. Keep your presence ever before us. Guide us in your way, and help us to be a light to others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. You all have a nice evening. We'll be back here next week uh, for one more, and then we'll have a Thanksgiving break.